Come on, everybody. All right, welcome to session two of our workshop. And thanks, Garen's got the slideshow in the chat, which is awesome. Um, so we're here and we've got uh, our usual team today. We can, um, Garen, do you wanna to flip to the introductions? Welcome back. Uh, Garen and I and JT um, from last week and we have some special guests with us today, Josh and Marvez, do you want, I know you're gonna like introduce yourselves more during your portion, but you just wanna say hello. <laughs> hello everyone, nice to meet all of you. Hi, I'm Josh, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out here on a Saturday. Excited to uh, do some, get into some uh, teaching data and some AI stuff. So it's gonna be a fun afternoon or morning, depending where you are in the world. Yeah, last week we did the, the grunt work. We made our scenarios. This week we get to play and have fun. <laughs> All right. Um, Garen, why don't you want to take it away and talk about why we're here? Yeah, great. So um, thanks everyone for coming to session two. Uh, just to quickly recap, in session one, we focused on generating some new simulations that were focused on issues of equity in K-12 education. And in the first session, we really focused on generating an annotation question. So some form of self-labeling or retrospective labels that participants would add uh, to their own responses as they uh, completed the simulation from, from the first workshop. After we created those simulations with those annotation questions, uh, we sent them out to a variety of people to use them. I will say we had uh, a few uh, smaller numbers of responses than we were hoping, um, but that's partly why we're doing this as a three session workshop. So we'll actually have another round of data collection between week two and week three. And today we're going to start talking about, you know, as that labeled data comes back, how do you make sense of it? How do you use it? How do you train an audio classifier or a text classifier? And then uh, session three, which we'll do uh, next Saturday, we'll think about once we have those classifiers in place, what kind of dynamic supports can we use? So if we're able to detect something interesting, like I said earlier, I've focused my work on detecting confusion, but I'm, we're gonna talk about what you're focusing on today. Um, but once you can detect those things, how do you dynamically respond? Um, what's a treat for us today is that uh, Josh Littenberg, Tobias and um, Marvez are, are both uh, using Teacher Moments and they are uh, experts. They are resident experts in thinking about AI and supports. And they are going to give us a bit of a, a preview and in, in, in review some of the ways in which we can work with the data, particularly uh, looking at uh, topic modeling. Um, so we're gonna be iterating to improve. So um, if you recall the first introduction, one of the core messages of building good simulations for learning is iterate, 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 and then iterate some more. Um, some of the simulations we've been working on were on like version 27. Uh, and those are the ones that are really good. Uh, and, and the way that they get really good is they started with a version one that looked very similar to the ones that you all made. And uh, we're gonna, we've baked into this whole process uh, time at the end of the session today to iterate on your work. Uh, so we're gonna use uh, a couple of talks, one, one focused on topic modeling, one focused on classifier training to sort of think about how we might iterate for the next data capture that we'll use with the simulations you generated. Uh, so we're going to do small groups first, where we're going to have folks connect and, and look at their own data. So you've got some data back from your simulations, and let's see what came back. Um, we authored some annotation questions. How did the annotations work out? How did the responses look? Uh, are the responses related to the annotation questions is a really critical thing to be asking at this stage. Uh, and if they're not, don't worry. Um, we've got the whole schedule set up to support you, whether or not the first annotation question was a good one. Uh, and we're going to look across the simulations and across the annotation questions and think about how we might coordinate some of these efforts today as well. Um, so then at 1225, we'll go into topic modeling. Uh, we'll have a break. We're, we're baking breaks in. Uh, we're, we're people. We need to get coffee and pastries or whatever it is that you snack on uh, in between these sessions. Uh, then we're going to go on to talking about how to build classifiers and how that fits into the sort of teacher moment system. 
Um, I will caveat that with, um, because the data collection this week was quite small, um, we're not gonna go into all of the details of training the classifier. We will go through all of the steps um, and we'll save some of that work for the next session. Uh, so I'm anticipating that we're gonna really push to really increase the data capture. And that involves you also sort of pushing and getting more people uh, to come and try these simulations. Uh, and then we'll, 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 we'll do what we can today around training classifiers, but you'll get a sense of the entire process and how to deploy and integrate classifiers into the system. So there's a lot of treats for you in that section. Then we'll have another break. Um, maybe it's time to refill the coffee. Uh, and then at the end, you get a chance to iterate, iterate, iterate. That's, that's what we got to do when we're working on simulations. And as I said before, this whole uh, set of workshop is, uh, is set up to help us understand how to improve the system. Uh, so we'll ask you to answer an exit survey and we'll be using your responses to inform like the next iteration of Teacher Moments as a platform. Uh, so we really appreciate your feedback and your input. And we'll be using that as we go forward with different proposals um, and moving proposals forward, uh, illustrating that we're really trying to listen to the community of users uh, to provide a system that helps them explore and, and conduct research on questions that are important to them. So let's start with small groups. Um, Josh, do you want to kick off this slide on examining data? Sure. Um, so as our first activity of the day, um, I think it's really good to start with something active rather than sort of just starting by, by listening to people talk. So we wanted you to get a chance to look at um, some of the data that was collected over the last week from the scenario that you created. Um, as Karen said, um, we did not get as many people uh, responding as we would have liked, but all the scenarios have some responses. Um, so what we want you to do is in your small groups, um, spend five minutes just kind of skimming through the data. So you don't have to read every response completely, but just sort of get a sense of like, what is it that people are saying in, in the scenario, particularly looking at, do you notice any kind of trends in terms of like, are people saying certain things or there are differences in how people respond to the same problem? And then after five minutes, so in the remaining five minutes, kind of talking against a group, and discussing like, what did you notice in the responses? Um, and then in terms of the groups, uh, Sarah, Sarah can, can, can you put on the next slide? Yeah, do we need to walk folks through, does everyone know what it means to look at the facilitator view or guarantee? Oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, Um, to just see. Yeah. So this is the, uh, Garen, do you want to describe the facilitators? Do you, do you want to? Sure, sure. Yeah. So each in that slide, there's four links. And Sarah, could you put the links in the chat maybe? Um, that will get you to the cohort view. Um, the things that you're going to want to be able to do is you're going to want to be able to um, view the responses in the cohort. Now, the best way that you can do that is if whoever created the cohort um, could manage participant access so that your team members are also facilitators. So you can click on facilitator and researcher. Go ahead and click both boxes. Um, so if everyone links into their, their um, scenario through the links that we have on the slide deck, and then whoever owns the scenario can update the facilitator and researcher checkboxes so that everyone can see it. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, make myself a facilitator and a researcher on this cohort. And if anybody needs help, Sarah or Josh or myself can get you the appropriate access. Once you're a facilitator, um, you can view the responses um, from the scenario that's in your cohort. When you click on view responses, that's going to load a table of all of the prompts and all of the response data that has been captured as a part of this. So here you can see that Josh Littenberg Tobias did this scenario um, and you have a little uh, data header. So in the authoring platform, each time you author a prompt, you have a little header column. You can update those if you want, but these are the prompts from the scenario. And then you can see uh, transcriptions of the audio followed by a little recording icon indicating that it was an audio recorded response. Uh, and you can go through, and if you click on any of the columns, it will show you what it looked like in the simulation. And you can actually go through the user response data that you can see um, next to uh, the, the response uh, in context. So you can see where, where that response came from. If you click on uh, 
the six annotation header. Here's a response, reflect, MMT. Here's Meredith's response to the simulation. You can see Amy's response to the simulation. So what we're gonna ask everyone to do is to get into their groups, um, make sure that everyone in the group has uh, both facilitator and researcher access to the scenario. And then you can just view the response data and read through it. And so one way, one strategy might be, let's read all of the enact audio prompt one responses and see if there's a trend in the data. Is that clear? Can people do like thumbs up or something if you if you if you understand? Yeah, good. Great. And and if there's people that are joining today for the first time today, um, after we send everyone off to breakout rooms, uh, we'll just ask. We'll give you a quick recap of the four simulations that were created in session one, and see if there's one team that you would like to join so that you can participate in this whole workshop today. And Gary, do you want to pop up the slide that has the breakout room? I know everyone has the slideshow, but just um, yeah, we'll pop up the um, slide that has the breakout rooms. Awesome. So um, hopefully uh, each group has been assigned a, a facilitator for this session. So hopefully we'll be able to pop in um, to see your data. But first, we're going to just make sure everybody who wasn't able to come last week gets to um, a room. So I think we can go ahead and the breakout rooms should be open. So um, go ahead and join the room that uh, goes with your authoring group. And then if you weren't able to come last week, hang here with us and we'll get you to a group. And, oh, thanks, JT. Um, Josh and Marvez, you are hey. up. Great. Um, well, thanks, everyone. Um, so in this uh, presentation, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about topic modeling. Um, so if you've never heard of topic modeling, um, that's why we're going to start kind of from the beginning, like what topic modeling is. We're going to talk about how topic modeling can be a potential place for thinking about the type of classifiers you would use uh, in teacher moments. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, Sarah, great. Um, so I am a research scientist at the Teaching Systems Lab. Uh, my PhD is in uh, educational measurement, so I kind of come from a more assessment, uh, kind of traditional quantitative social science background. Um, but I'm really interested in technology and learning within large scale learning environments. How can we design environments that promote um, equ equity, both in teaching and access uh, to, to learning? Um, what about me personally? So I have um, two kids, uh, Stella, who's seven, and Ruby, who's three and a half. Uh, hopefully they won't come up, uh, but you never know um, in, days, in, in these days of uh, at home learning. Um, and then sort of, I, I like a bunch of uh, hobbies, uh, mostly to do things around the house. Uh, and Marvez, how, how about you? Also my uh, pronouns are Kiki, he and him. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Marvez. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the Teaching Systems Lab. I have a background in cognitive sciences um, and I've been doing a lot of research on educational simulations and game design. And I also have been working on our natural language processing, um, like software development for teacher moments. A uh, personal fact, I'm finishing my thesis this semester. So ooh, fingers crossed for graduation. Um, so in today's session, uh, we're going to learn about uh, what topic modeling is and how you might use it with uh, data from teacher moments. Um, learning sort of more specifically about how topic modeling could be used as sort of a starting place for developing more specific labels that could be used uh, with AI to give uh, feedback on performance and simulations. And finally, we're gonna kind of go back to your data. So you're gonna get a chance to actually look at some uh, topic data from, from your own simulations and have a chance to think about, okay, what does, how can this data help us think about the design and what type of classifiers we, uh, we, might, we might develop? 
Um, so just to start off uh, in the chat, um, if everyone could put, so to answer two questions. One, uh, what did your group notice about the responses you saw in teacher moments when you looked at the facilitator's view from the scenario that you created? And how easy was it for you just sort of skimming through to detect themes um, just by looking at, at the responses? Zarka, do you have a question? I see, I see that your hand is raised. So uh, <clears throat> the question, do you want us to respond to this now or just? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, if you could respond in the chat. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So just kind of going through the responses, um, some people said that it was difficult to kind of detect themes. Some people said it was easier. Uh, a lot of people noticed uh, variation um, in how people responded, which is always a good thing when you're looking at a scenario, like seeing that people are responding in different ways sometimes can be useful uh, in terms of thinking about how, um, how your scenario is going. Just so I can get a, get a sense of our, um, is anyone, if you need more time, you just, you know, put your hand up or put like an emoji in the chat so I can kind of see, see where people are. All right, I think, um, Sarah, can, can, can you put on the next slide? Um, so one of the challenges with looking at simulation data is that it can be very complex to analyze, uh, particularly if you have a large amount of, of data. Um, if you have a small amount of data, sometimes you can kind of get a sense or do some type of, you know, qualitative analysis. But you know, if you have hundreds of lines of text, sometimes it can be a very cumbersome and time-consuming activity. Um, so one of the things that uh, we uh, in my team have been using is topic modeling. Um, so a little bit about what topic modeling is. So it's a method for detecting patterns within large data sets of unstructured tasks by identifying latent topics within each piece of text. So the idea of this is a form of unsupervised uh, machine learning, which means that you don't have to have labeled data. You could just uh, put data in and it will automatically sort of detect based on the associations between specific phrases and words, what are the underlying topics? So example I'll give is imagine you're looking at two um, pages, two articles from the sports page. Um, and one of the articles had, is about baseball. Um, so you would expect to see terms like pitcher and catcher and home run and baseball and umpire, because those are terms that are specific to baseball. If it was an article about 
um, American football, you might see something like yard and touchdown and field goal. And those are specific to um, football. Now, obviously there are words like game and player and stadium that are kind of similar across, but you know, if you give the model of data, you kind of pick out, oh, these are the words that are coming from together that in the articles that are about baseball, and these are the articles that are about football. Um, so that's kind of a basic example, but that's sort of how the model works. It finds words that are kind of in, occurring in common together and sort of picks out potential topics that are occurring um, in the data. Um, and what's nice about this is you don't have to have any prior assumptions. So you can kind of uh, put the data into the model and it will kind of show you what are some of the underlying trends that are happening in the data. Um, next slide. Um, so kind of taking it one step further, uh, we focus on a specific type of topic modeling, which is called structural topic modeling. Um, it's a type of topic model where you can actually include covariates. So you can include um, other predictors that might be associated with the topics that you're seeing in, in, in the data. Um, and this was a, it was a, a uh, it's in addition to being a method, there's also a very, very well documented R package with lots of work through examples. Uh, if any of you are R users, I highly recommend um, checking out this particular package. Um, and so what's nice about the structural topic model is it allows you to see there are certain topics associated with other things. Um, so this is an example uh, from their article. They looked at blog posts um, from the 2008 uh, presidential campaign. And they're looking at, you know, how did, what topics were more common on liberal blogs and what comments were more common on conservative blogs. And they, it was a, it was a uh, interval metric. So it could be more liberal or more conservative. And interestingly, um, the Obama was a lot more likely to come up on uh, conservative blogs, while the Bush presidency was more likely to come up on, on uh, liberal blogs. Um, so um, if any remember the 2008 campaign, you know, the liberal, there was a lot of focus among um, liberals about being upset about the Bush presidency, and then many conservatives at that point wanted to sort of move on uh, from Bush. So that might be why we're seeing a lot of focus on sort of not liking Obama or maybe on Sarah Palin, uh, but not so much on Bush. Um, so this is kind of useful if you want to see, like, is there any other associated factor that we're interested in that might be related to the topics that we're seeing in the data? Uh, ne next slide. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit um, about uh, our own work with uh, teacher moments. Um, and you're actually going to have an opportunity to sort of see some under the hood of some of the the work that we're doing uh, with AI uh, using teacher moment scenarios. Um, so the background here is in March, 2020, uh, right when the world was locking down, uh, we launched a new course on edX called Becoming a More Equitable Educator. Um, and this course was all about the idea of equity mindsets. Um, so the course was structured on a series of mindsets by education, and we sort of presented them as a pair. So for example, an equality mindset would say, all students should be treated equally. We shouldn't give uh, more advantages to one, one student than the other. My goal as a teacher is to be fair to all students. Uh, where an equity mindset said, students have different needs and some students need more support than others. And my job as a teacher is to figure out what is it that that student needs. And I might have to give more attention or more dedication to particular students who need more support. Um, and so one of our sort of underlying theories was that these mindsets are out of balance in modern schools. That Teachers um, as a whole tend to lean too heavily on the equity side rather uh, on the equality side, I'm sorry, than the equity side. And it's not that equality is, is totally wrong and or equity is right all the time, but we think that these mindsets are out of balance. And the goal of the course was to shift people from an equality mindset to more of an equity mindset and actually apply that within their practice. So thinking about not just like what they believe about education, but how can they make their practice more equitable by incorporating these mindsets in, into their teaching. Um, so in addition to being uh, one of our most successful courses to date, uh, it was also a uh, first course that actually included teacher moments within the platform. So we launched it, it teacher moments as, as its own independent platform had only been around for a few months. And so this, this was actually an exciting opportunity to actually integrate teacher moments within the course. Um, and because it was such a successful course, um, we collected uh, a lot of data. So we got, um, you know, there were four simulations within the course itself. 
And we had almost a thousand people do at least one of them. And many did multiple of the simulations. So altogether, there was 27,000 rows of data, which is more data than anyone could possibly analyze using qualitative coding, unless you had a huge team of, of assistants looking through all the data. So that wasn't, I, I was really interested in sort of what people were doing in the simulations, but sort of qualitatively coding all of them was not the way to go. So I was look, interested in is, you know, using topic modeling to understand what was happening in, in the data. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm going to kind of, so that was sort of the, the, the context. Now I'm gonna kind of zoom in on a problem of practice um, that kind of came up after we implemented uh, the uh, courses. So in the original courses themselves, there was no AI in the simulations. You, you did the simulations sort of without any feedback. Um, and this was because we didn't yet have the capability to that. We didn't have collected any data. So we didn't know how people were going to respond to these scenarios. Um, so you would do the whole scenario um, and you wouldn't get any feedback um, within the scenario itself. Now, AMP, our sort of solution to how do we provide feedback was that we created a, a video debrief that occurred after um, the, the simulation. So actually you would see how other people responded to the simulation. And the idea was by seeing how other people responded, it might change how you thought about your own response. Uh, however, we've been doing some, some research on the effectiveness of these video debriefs. Um, and although um, they were very well done, and I think that they actually point out a lot of issues that come up in the simulation, um, people aren't necessarily changing their mindsets after watching these videos. And it seems to have an effect where sort of people kind of see what they want to see in the video. So they see someone saying something, they're like, oh, that's what I did too. Um, and so <clears throat> we think it's really important to actually integrate feedback more uh, thoroughly into the simulation itself. So people can really see what it is that they're doing and is what they're doing actually aligned with more of an equity mindset. Um, so we're going to actually test out a prototype. So this, this prototype, um, we have just developed this week. Um, and we've only tested it internally. So you are going to be like the first testers of, of this particular prototype. Uh, we integrated uh, an AI classifier into two of the prompts in the scenario. Um, so this is a version of the Jeremy's Journal with AI uh, included. Um, as a, I just want to make it clear, this is a prototype. Some things may not work out as well as we would like. So if you hit a bug or something isn't working, um, please let us know in the chat. There's also be an opportunity because um, we think it's really important to understand how the AI is working. So we're going to ask you for some feedback about the AI itself within the scenario. So when you get feedback, we'll actually ask you, did you think that this was good feedback or not? Um, and so we're going to take the next 15 minutes. If you could um, go through the scenario and just kind of see as you're going through, like, what is it? What, what, how is the AI responding to what people are saying? And what is it looking for? Um, and do you think that this feedback would be helpful for someone who is going through this um, simulation in, in a course by themselves? Um, so everyone, does everyone uh, have the link I see is posted in the chat. Um, I also put it in the slide deck. Does everyone just kind of thumbs up? Does everyone have access to, to, to the scenario? Can everyone see it and, and, and log in? Okay, great. So let's timer, we'll, we'll at one o'clock we will reconvene. Um, we can talk a little bit about kind of how we develop this particular uh, so AI supports. That would be helpful. Great. Um, and Sarah, can you put on the, on the next slide? Um, so, so for some context, uh, so in the first uh, run of, of the course, we used topic modeling to look at um, what were the trends out in, in, the, in the simulation data. And we looked at the almost a thousand responses uh, to, to Jeremy's journal um, without really knowing. We had some ideas about like, what type of trends or variation there might be, because uh, we had done some pilots uh, with various schools, but we hadn't collected data at a, kind of a large scale. Um, and some of the most interesting findings was that a lot of the, the topics that kind of came up in the data were topics that 
we had the designers have sort of thought of, oh, this is something that we're including in the scenario because we think that people might respond to it differently. So one of the topics, and so we use the structural topic modeling to look at the correlation between uh, Respondents were views about equity, equality, mindsets. We had a survey measure that we used to measure equity versus equality. And then we looked at the prevalence of specific topics um, in the data. And one of the things that we noticed was that certain topics were more associated with an equality mindset and certain topics were more associated with an equity mindset. So people who, according to their survey responses, had more of an equality mindset were more likely to mention things such as Jeremy's focus in class and sort of in, in a sort of almost negative way of like, oh, he's sort of not paying attention, he's goofing off, like something was wrong with him. Um, and also to mention the school policy about the about the doctor's note. Um, whereas people with more of an equity mindset were more likely to mention uh, when he gave the note, oh, I'm glad you're feeling better, Jeremy. Um, and also to talk about his own understanding of preparing this for quiz. Um, so this was a good start, um, but one of the challenges with the topic modeling is that it doesn't, you know, the categories are not quite clean, uh, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish between, you know, things that are positive and things that are negative um, in topic modeling data, and also sometimes hard to kind of understand, like, what do all these topics mean specifically. Uh, so this was very promising in helping us kind of pick out some emergent themes, but it wasn't really enough to provide people with meaningful feedback um, in the data uh, when they were actually doing um, the Jeremy's journal themselves. Um, so next slide. So we kind of took the topics and started to think about what are the things that we want to give people feedback about uh, when they're doing Jeremy's journal. Um, and so we use the topics as sort of the basis for thinking about what are the types of labels that we want to generate in the data. So for example, there, you saw that topic about his understanding of preparedness for the quiz. Um, so clearly there were some that people who were very keyed into like where Jeremy was struggling and where he was struggling academically. That was clearly an important factor in terms of thinking about people's own experience uh, within the simulation. Um, Another one was uh, at the bottom of this table, um, thinking about Jeremy's own sort of emotional and mental health, thinking about people who looked at concern for Jeremy, uh, thinking about making, like, can we detect whether people are recognizing something's going on with Jeremy mentally that's making it difficult for him to engage in class. One of the things that we realized as we were labeling the data is that this isn't a, a binary construct. Um, that this actually is multifaceted. So some people are noticing and very keyed into Jeremy's academic struggles, but aren't paying attention to the social emotional um, state. While other people are very focused on how he's doing social emotionally, uh, but aren't really looking at the academics. And this is not that one is necessarily better than the other, but I think it's important as you're going through the scenario that if you're really focused on the academics, like maybe it's time to step back and really, how is Jeremy doing as a person? Um, and similarly, if you're very focused on Jeremy as a person, when you're not actually looking at his work very carefully, it might be useful to go back and see kind of how he's doing. So that was sort of the way we, we were thinking about structuring the feedback. Uh, Marvis is now going to take you kind of through back, like how do we actually build this in um, teacher moments? Great. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, so after we did the topic models, we realized that we can create these rubrics to score responses like Josh just showed on the last side. So when someone types a response into teacher moments, we get their text file and we call that a document of the couple sentences that they wrote in response to something on teacher moments. Then we can take a subset of all the responses of like everyone who's ever responded to Jeremy's journal and code them based on some rubric, such as uh, things like, does this response mention Jeremy's academic struggles, zero or one? Uh, one is yes. Does this response mention Jeremy's social emotional struggles, zero or one? For, for instance, we have um, more like specific categories. But then all of these scored responses make up a program that we train to recognize certain responses. We take a chunk of the data, we train a model on all of these zero and ones across all these different rubric factors, and then we test our new model with a um, a different subset of the data and see how well it does. Uh, so once we put that model on the backend server for teacher moments, whenever a new response is entered into teacher moments, like you all just did, I was watching the server backend, making sure everything was going okay. 
Uh, once you guys enter a response into teacher moments, that response is compared to all the responses in the saved model, and then you'll receive a score, which is translated into your personal feedback. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is an example of what's going on in the back end. So we have all these different variable names called like Jeremy effort, learn challenge, change for, uh, more sum, and Jeremy mental. And based on whether a response scores a zero and one across multiple categories, a participant can receive all these different types of feedback. And you might recognize some of these from what you just saw uh, when you're doing Jeremy's journal. So we're hoping to notice a few different things. Do people notice his academic needs? Do they notice his social emotional needs? And um, if you get all of that right, how can you continue to support him? If you don't notice any of that, what can you think about in your teaching that might currently be challenging for him? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I just want to say one thing, Marvis, that's okay. Um, yeah. So we actually put, so we had one. So if people were focused on Jeremy effort, which is sort of like this idea that Jeremy is sort of intentionally goofing off, we sort of, that was the red flag for the system kind of responding. Because uh, we want to make sure that if people's, our sort of mindset toward Jeremy is, is initially hostile, that we correct that. Um, I think that that, is a case where we would want sort of immediate intervention. And then we had a number of different sort of interventions that were more, okay, well, if you notice this thing, but didn't notice this thing, let's give you some feedback. Yeah, that's right. And um, I just wanted to give an example from a, like one of our original um, implementations in teacher moments, so like sort of simplified how the back end splits um, the personalized feedback. So for instance, uh, we had this one teacher moments uh, where you looked at a tweet, which was satirical. We were asking participants, how do you know this tweet is trust this tweet is trustworthy or not? And based on their response, um, the classifier would determine if the participant could identify if that account was satire. And if they identified satire, they got feedback that, that was correctly identified. And if satire was not identified, the participant received feedback on how to try a task again with explicit lateral reading instructions, which was a part of a different MOOC we ran on um, sorting truth from fiction and digital literacy. Next slide. Uh, Josh is now gonna talk about um, some topic modeling on your yeah. data. So we um, um, actually, uh, so we want you to be able to go through this process yourself. Um, so this week I ran structural topic models on all of your uh, data from the pilot. Um, just as a as a uh, word of caution, uh, it was definitely not enough data to run very stable topic models. So the data is probably more um, like even if you re-ran the model, you might get different results. Um, but I do think it's useful just as a way of seeing like what is it that is kind of happening in my, in my data. Um, a little bit of some context about how I ran the model. So one of the, because it was um, audio data, I used the pauses and hesitation to break up the text. And then I ran it. So each, each sort of like segment was its own document. And the reason for this is because people often mention specific top, like multiple topics in the same response, but they sort of divide up to sentences or, or pauses. And so if you break it up, one, you get more documents and two, sometimes it, it is able to pick up more specific topics that way. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I, I broke up the text. Um, so uh, I think uh, there's a link to your data in the chat. I also put um, made a GitHub repository with the code that I ran on all the data. So then you can um, download a CSV for teacher moments, put it into the data set, and it will run. It'll, it will, and then you can kind of play around with the different specifications if you want to, you know, structure your data in a different way. If you want to look at different other things, um, so the code is publicly available. So you're welcome to use it and kind of adapt it how, 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 however you choose um, in the future. Um, so we're not going to have a chance to um, uh, right now. You're welcome during the break to kind of take a look at your data. But we're actually at the end of the session. We're going to go back and we're going to look at um these topics in groups and we're going to think about um after you hear garen's explanation of, of building AI classifiers how can you um based upon what you're seeing in the top of data how can you uh think about what types of classifiers you would want to build um, and this will kind of be in a, in a good uh, place for next week when you're thinking about feedback so this is really going to help you really think about okay what is it that i want to give people feedback on in, in, in their scenario
Um, great. So we, we've hit the break time. Um, Sarah, Garen, anything else you want to say before we had a few out to breaks? I just want to express appreciation for uh, both uh, Josh and Marvez sharing their fantastic work. Um, it's just beautiful to see uh, such a great and thoughtful presentation of how to examine data that comes back from teacher moments. And it's just such a great opportunity to see that at scale. Um, so I know that a lot of folks that are participating now are just starting out and just trying things in different places. Um, but this is a good preview to as when you start scaling your data up and as you start getting implementations across multiple sites, multiple users, year over year data collection, uh, you too will have 963 respondents and thousands of uh, uh, texts rows to process. Uh, so it was really a treat to see that, Josh, and I just want to express our gratitude for uh, sharing those insights. And then let's uh, take a moment to have a break, get coffee, uh, get a snack, uh, do whatever you need to do. Uh, and we'll plan on getting back at uh, 125. So that's about 10 minutes from now. And I'm gonna open the breakout rooms too, just cause we have a little bit of a longer break than we anticipated in case folks wanna talk about anything uh, Josh said or um, the, the spreadsheet that he shared with your data. So those rooms will be open if you want them, but also feel free to go take a break from the computer. Okay. So thanks for uh, taking the time to take a look at your topics. And those are very great questions. And again, thanks to Josh and Marvez for sharing the research they're doing. I just wanna take a moment to plug the community of practice. So one of the things that we actively do is support anyone using Teacher Moments through a few month events, uh, four months of, uh, four events a month. Uh, Sarah runs those. Uh, so reach out to Sarah if you're not already connected to the community of practice. Um, Josh presents at the community of practice meetings and, and talks about the insights that, uh, and so does Marvez, uh, about the insights they're, they're gathering from the MOOC research uh, as a means of sharing uh, that with the community of researchers that are interested in using simulations. Um, so if any of this feels like, oh, I don't quite get it yet, that's totally fine. Come and hang with us. Like we love talking about this stuff um, and we'll be there. So uh, what we're gonna talk about next is classifier training. Uh, the intention for today's session was to walk you through training a classifier, uh, but I do want to mention that we did not get enough data to do that today. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to share what we can um, with about this process, and then we're going to hold some of that for session three. So we'll, we'll have an abbreviated classifier training in session three, uh, because we're really going to push to get more people using these simulations to get you more data. Um, so hopefully, I don't think we'll get you 20,000 records by next week, um, but it, maybe like 50 would be great. Um, and I don't, I don't feel like we got to that point with a lot of the simulations. Uh, and so we're going to maybe ask if everyone can share the link with everybody else to, if, if each person could get about five people to come and try these simulations, uh, we would have plenty of data. Uh, so I think that's going to be the ask that we'll have after this week. And, uh, and without further ado, I'm going to go over the process of classifier training in Teacher Moments and give you some insights and some guidance uh, related to some of the work that I've been doing in audio classification. So first off, I wanted to talk quickly about what is classification, right? Um, so uh, basically, it's the probability of Y given X. Pretty simple. Uh, so X is a series of features. So it might be like words that appear in a text response. It might be the tone of a voice that shows up in an audio response. It's a, it's a set of features. Um, and you can see on the right, there's a, a chart of like maybe two features, X0, X1. That could be like uh, a word, a voice, uh, uh, any sort of feature in, in, in vocal expression. And your data sort of fits in that feature space. And what you're trying to do with the classifier is identify a boundary that separates what your outcome variable is or your Y. Um, so in uh, one example, there was, uh, uh, AC Lane simulation uh, was asking uh, if your response, did you sound confident? Um, that's a yes, no question. That's what the annotation component is there for. It's to create that Y variable for you. Um, and, and what you want to do is sort of take that variable and see if you can use features to establish a boundary around your data that helps you classify, is it a yes or is it a no? That's simply what you're trying to do. But what I want to point out quickly is in that chart, I'm, say, that's, I'm highlighting a chart that says original data. So you can imagine, like Josh was saying, when they trained, and Marvez, when they trained a classifier for Jeremy's journal, they were using data from a, a data collection on uh, 963 respondents from a MOOC. Um, but when you go and use that elsewhere with another group of people, um, it's, it's new data, it's novel data. And so one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, 
how much does the data that I've collected and trained um, prepare me to make predictions about future users? And I wanna put in a cautionary note about three reasons why um, when you build a model, you need to think about how am I gonna update that model? Uh, so there's this notion of concept drift. Um, so I'll take uh, AC Lane's example again of uh, were you confident in your response? You can see on concept drift, there's this chart of original data and then a chart next to it of real concept drift. Um, and, and what that kind of indicates is the group that I trained my data on um, identified particular vocal features about confident expressions that I was able to build a boundary around. But when I interacted with new users, they had a different sense of what those boundaries were for what is a confident response versus a non-confident response. And so you can imagine um, if you train your classifier in say North America <laughs> and then use it in say, um, France, <laughs> like maybe there's differences in vocal expressions. Maybe in Quebec, it's different. Uh, we don't know. Um, but that's exactly one of the exactly interesting uh, things to explore in this research is as we start thinking about different contexts, different locations, uh, what are things that we learn about the things that we're measuring? And how does AI research help us better understand these concepts, which I think is a really, really great opportunity. Uh, the second thing that happens frequently is something called label shift. Um, in this example, the top chart demonstrates like at the beginning of an outbreak that maybe there's a 10% uh, case prevalence where there's 10 people, let's say there's 10% with COVID. We'll just use COVID as the example um, at the early stages. Uh, and then you train a model with like a 10% prevalence rate. And you can see that red bar, that red line, building a predictive model of, of whether or not you're going to predict that someone has COVID. Um, and then imagine that the outbreak uh, has actually gone on for a while and it's spread a bunch. And now you have a 70% positive rate case. So the label shift really indicates that something is characteristically changed in the distribution of what you're trying to predict. So going from 10% to going to 70%, um, what that typically does in a model is it leads to uh, under prediction. So if you, if you think that your prevalence is about 10%, your machine or AI learning, machine learning model um, will, will gravitate towards uh, under prediction if, if it spreads, if there's more prevalence of what you're trying to predict. So going back to AC's confidence audio response, if you trained on a data set where only 10% of the responses were confident, and then you use that classifier in a place where 90% of the responses were confident, it would probably under predict confidence. Um, the last thing I want to mention is uh, the notion of covariate shift. And this is when uh, the features that you're using dramatically change. And so the distribution that you trained on ends up being very different than the distribution that you're predicting on. And um, an example of this, and I'll use audio with a fun little example. Um, imagine you've trained uh, an audio classifier on whether or not the response sounded confident. Uh, and then suddenly, for whatever reason, you go and use the simulation where everyone breathes in a helium balloon before they give a response. And the voice tone and pitch just goes up. Like it, that's what happens when you, when you breathe in helium before you talk, because you have a really high pitched voice. Uh, all the features that you've trained on are very different in characteristic in the distribution than the features that you're trying to predict. And you can see the lack of overlap between the train distribution and the test distribution leads to issues with prediction because you're not actually getting the same kind of features back. So those are three different reasons why new data coming in can actually dramatically change what the model needs to pay attention to. And this is why models need to constantly be updated. That's why whenever you build a model, you need to think through the process of how am I gonna continuously update the model as new data arrives? Um, and there's a great article down at the bottom on data distribution shifts and monitoring. Uh, and it literally came out uh, four days ago. I wish it had come out a month ago um, because one of the things that's, that's actually really uh, a critical and interesting about this space is that uh, AI systems and system development for uh, researching AI are, are really at their infancy. And people in industry and people in research use very different terminology for all of these things. So it's really hard to go into the literature at times and make sense of it. But this article just does a great job of connecting both research that's going on in industry and research that's going on in, in the academy and sort of making sense of that at a conceptual level and drawing on insights from both researchers and product designers. So this is a great read, I highly recommend it. Um, and I think it's, a, it's a, an example of a material that's been developed for a course that's gonna be taught at Stanford this year on AI systems development. There's an accompanying book that has also been published this year on that topic from this author. 
Um, so when we think about the need to update our classifiers in our, in our system, um, one of the things that you started off with was creating labeled data through the annotation component. And as you go from that labeled data, um, the three steps that you'll do from your labeled data set is you'll go through and create uh, feature extraction. Um, so you'll basically pull out, um, if it's text, you might pull out um, words as features. Um, if it's audio, you might pull out um, dimensions of prosodic expression. Uh, and, and those are the features that you're using to train your classifier. After you've got the features extracted, you then can go through a training process where it's going to train a machine learning classifier. And that's all about establishing that boundary. How do I separate the data using these features to figure out what's the yes and what's the no? Um, after you've built your classifier, you need to evaluate. Um, and this is a really important thing, particularly as we think about research on equity. Um, I would encourage you to think about not only how accurate my classifier is, but for whom is it accurate? So there's a lot of literature out there on algorithmic bias. So we need to start thinking if we're working on issues of equity, how do we build responsibly? How do we build just technologies? And this is an opportunity for you uh, to think about how am I gonna incorporate that type of evaluation in the accuracy of the work that I engage with when I do AI. After you've got a sense of the accuracy and the potential biases that might be within the uh, machine learning classifiers you've trained, Finally, you need to operationalize it. You need to take that classifier and put it out in the world and use it. Um, and so in this section, we're gonna talk about how you deploy a new classifier to teacher moments. Um, and by deploying it into the same simulation where you started your label collection, what you'll end up with is a simulation that has a machine learning classifier that's predicting a particular label that is in a simulation where at the end, the participants are also providing additional annotations on the same question the classifier is trying to answer. And so that's completing the loop and it's creating a system with a feedback loop. So effectively you're training a classifier off student labels. You're then using that classifier to make predictions within the simulation. And then you're collecting labels also when you're making predictions. And then that can feed into a continuous cycle of improvement. So as we've talked about the different distributional shifts that can occur within your data in your classification problems, this is a cycle that will help support responding to when I start using this in different contexts and there's different characteristics, I can keep updating that classifier so that it will continue to perform at anticipated levels of accuracy. So this is Teacher Moment's perspective of self-determined AI. So what we've been working so hard on is this notion of supporting the educator to really take the reins in terms of the AI creation. So I see this as how does the community that's using the simulations engage directly with the AI creation? So um, uh, I've used the phrase, nothing about us without us, which is an old disability rights adage. Uh, and I'd like to see that as people start adopting AI, that they're participants in the creation of that AI. And so if you as the educator are creating a, a simulation, so you get to pick what the problem of practice is that you're gonna look at, and you get to pick an annotation question, which is the yes or no question that this, the participants will reflect on. And then the students are improvisationally responding to the problem of practice you've selected to work on. And they're also participating in the label generation of how we're identifying expressions within our own communication, that that can create this loop uh, that will support continuous improvement and feedback towards the goal of a self-determined AI, where uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a central organization creating all of the AI that you consume, you can actually make the AI yourself, which is the goal. And that's what we're working on today. So I'm excited that you're here. Um, now, what this whole cycle looks like is a series of steps. So as I mentioned, our data collection was actually quite small last week, and we're gonna address that this week um, by, by really uh, uh, lifting up every rock and, and getting everyone to come in and play. Uh, but uh, what, what I'll do is I'll walk through what I can in terms of classifier training. And like I said, I'm gonna hold a couple of these steps until session three so that we have a chance to go through those as well. Um, because I do want to make sure that we're supporting you in terms of generating your own classifiers and, and making sure that you understand the steps that are necessary for the evaluation and the deployment of those classifiers to create this loop. Um, so first off, uh, if you wanted, you, we sent you a, a link to a Google Sheet, um, but you also can directly download the data from Teacher Moments. So if you created a uh, cohort, which everyone has, you can go to the download section. Um, you can actually go to the simulation directly or you can find the cohort. So you can search for the name of your simulation or search for the name of your cohort. And then it should come back in a result set of an available download file. 
Uh, in step three, you can see a little icon that shows you the little uh, file icon is what you click on to download the data. And if you download that, that will come back with a zip file. The zip file will contain four um, files within it. And let me just walk quickly through what those four files are. Uh, there's metascenarios.json. And in the scenarios file, that gives you information about the scenario and how it was designed, what the name is, who owns it, et cetera. Um, and then the notion of meta participants will give you as much information as we can about the users that have logged into the system and, and used your scenario. Um, we keep the participant information separate because we would like researchers to feel uh, able to process and work with data without necessarily knowing who the users are. So as you're leading your research efforts, you can think about your own data access rights and pipeline for how you'll connect the various um, participants that will go and, and use this data for research. Um, there's an annotations file, and the annotations file is literally the yes and no question, but the annotations is designed with the intention of keeping it as self-contained as possible, so that if you're trying to train a classifier, our goal is for annotations to be the only file you need to look at. Uh, so the annotations file will have the yes, no values, and it will have the response data in it. Um, and that's the information that you need to train a classifier. I will say that we did notice um, ahead of this workshop that the annotations on audio downloads aren't complete. Uh, so we have a fix that we'll probably be deploying in a week or two uh, that will make the annotations file for audio self-contained as well. Um, but never fear, uh, you've always got that um, easy to read uh, C9 DF uh, 3A C6 file, the one with the, the hash, um, that's all of your simulation response data. Uh, so when you have all of your simulation response data, you can always get anything that you need. Uh, so in order to process audio annotation data, at this point, you just need to do a, a couple of maneuvers with your data um, setup where you'll connect the annotations file to the easy to read uh, C9DF3 file. Uh, and they've got the same headers and columns and we can walk you through what it takes to do that. Um, but again, because our data collection is so small, that's probably gonna be covered in session three, but I just wanted to get you familiar at this stage with the files that come back. And I would encourage everyone to work with their groups uh, to make sure that you have researcher access on both the simulation and the cohort. So you can search and find it in your downloads tab. And once you can search and find it in your downloads tab, you can, um, you can access and download these files. Uh, we're not going to do that as a group right now, but when we get into our breakout session at the third segment of this uh, workshop, uh, we'll help you make sure that everyone has access to the downloads. Um, so your data. Uh, first off, I'm so excited. It is so great to see this. Like um, This has been like two and a half years of effort to get to a point where we can support anybody that wants to do AI research to engage with the platform and, and do some of this work. And it's happening. You're doing it. Uh, so uh, the, the top row represents the uh, simulations, uh, the names of the simulations that this group has created. And then I've pulled out, uh, in some, some simulations had more than one annotation question, so I just pulled out one annotation question for each simulation. Um, and you can see that the ends are quite small, um, but it's promising. And I want to point out some things here that are interesting to me um, and encourage you to think about uh, how we're going to iterate uh, in this process of working towards creating and constructing AI. Um, so first off, uh, I've highlighted in yellow um, some keywords that I see in terms of the annotation questions that folks have gravitated towards. Uh, so you'll notice that in the first one, there was an audio classifier asking, do you sound confident in this response? That would be asking you to listen to your audio response and see if that person sounds confident. I would say that uh, in the next one, interpreting EdTech dashboards, do you feel confident in your ability to use the data from your dashboard to prepare your next class? That was a text response and you're asking folks if they feel confident. Um, I actually think there's an opportunity here. So it looks like both of these annotation approaches are trying to detect and predict if someone was confident in their response. And one way or one strategy uh, to, to tackle this might be to um, revise and iterate the second simulation to have an audio response and ask the same question as the first one, do you sound confident in this response? So ask them about their uh, use of data from the dashboard and then, and then have them reflect on their audio response and see if they sound confident. Now, why I'm suggesting this is because when you think about um, what 
what, when do you use a text response and when do you use an audio response? I would suggest that if I personally were trying to detect confidence, I would go in the direction of audio data. Um, but there are examples uh, out there in text analysis. Um, I think IBM Watson has something called uh, uh, certainty uh, as a, a tonal analyzer produces a certainty variable to determine the extent to which a text response sounds like a certain response. Uh, so I feel like there's some components and parallels to text analysis, but personally, and maybe this is just my personal bias, um, I would go after an audio measurement for confidence because I think there's more signal in voice than there is in text. And I draw on that because in my thesis work, I spent about three years looking at emotions in text. And it's really difficult um, to connect how someone is feeling uh, to the text that they're typing. And um, let me just say uh, your fingers, uh, physiological emotions to me is a physiological experience. And your fingers, um, they have your little heart heart rate in them. They have like physiological response related to your emotion system. And your voice has uh, physiological uh, changes and modulations in your expressions that are related to your physiological system for your emotions. Um, but when your fingers are typing on a keyboard, you lose all of that physiological data. Um, there are things like sensors that you can use for like heart rate monitoring, skin conductance, all of that. Um, but with voice data, um, the modulation of the voice, the physiological experience of emotion is potentially easier to potentially get a line of sight on with the measure. So if you're interested in feeling, um, I would encourage voice analysis um, if you're interested, but let me give a counter example uh, where I think text is a really good candidate. Um, on the fourth example of uh, teacher's dilemma on cyberbullying, this looks like a great candidate to me for a text analysis. It's asking, did you ask the student to provide evidence like a picture uh, from Snapchat or WhatsApp? So it's very much in the words. It's like the words that you're using, are they explicitly asking for evidence with what they have said? The words is exactly the right thing in my mind uh, to measure, to make a prediction about whether or not the response within the simulation was asking the student to provide evidence. Uh, so I think this is a great, great example of why you would wanna use a text response and, and text analysis. Um, when you come into the third thing that I haven't spoken about yet, finding our own ways for self-directed data literacy and learning. Uh, do you feel comfortable practicing using digital devices for your own learning? So one of the immediate red flags um, in terms of what came back from the first iteration was it was all yeses. Um, so every single response was a yes to this question. Um, and I would say that that is potentially problematic uh, when it comes to building a classifier uh, because you don't have data on both cases. Class imbalance definitely is gonna happen. So it could be that you have more of one class and less of another. So it could be more yeses and fewer no's, that's fine. But if it's a complete divide like this where everybody is a yes, um, it might not be the right thing to go after in terms of a classifier. And again, we're gonna have time at the end of the session to think about how we iterate, how we, how we revise. And, um, and, and again, it's brilliant that you have done this. It's brilliant that you've made a simulation. It's brilliant that you've made an annotation question and you've got some data back now. And now we can go through that iterative process and think about how we might improve. Um, now, uh, now there's, I think that for that group that's looking at finding our own ways for self-directed data literacy, um, you can think about, okay, if the first two go in the direction of doing voice analysis for confidence, maybe confidence is related to comfort. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe confidence is a little bit more interesting than comfort because everything came back as a yes with comfort. Um, so maybe there's a way to link all three of those studies using the same annotation question, in which case the data that comes back to work towards a confidence predictor um, would actually be tripled uh, by the users that go through and do the simulations. Um, also, I would encourage that group to say, oh, look at this great example from the uh, cyberbullying team uh, that came up with this fantastic text analysis question. And if you wanna stick with text, do you wanna go after a text analysis? This is a great model uh, of a fantastic annotation question that is really gonna get at a particular uh, aspect of like words uh, that are related to uh, identifying what you're trying to predict. Uh, so I think those are great. Uh, and, and you'll notice again with the numbers that we have on the yeses and nos, there really wasn't enough data at this stage to train a classifier and that's fine. Um, as you saw, Josh was able to create a bunch of topic modeling data and you're gonna be able to use that. You're gonna be able to iterate. Um, and then what we're really gonna do this week is we're really gonna push. So I, I'd like to get at least 50 records collected for every simulation. And if we all try to get about five people to do our simulations, 
Um, we will we'll probably get towards 50. So we'll put a little email together. Here's all the five simulations. It takes about 30 minutes to get through them all. Um, see if you can get about five people to do that. Um, we'll push in, in our networks to try to get as many people as we can. And then we'll see how much data we can collect in this manner. And again, if we link some of these simulations to have similar annotation questions, that's actually one of the key principles of why we have a community of practice. What's kind of cool about this is that simulation-based learning has some commonalities, like is your response sounding confident is something that is probably important to a whole host of simulations, right? And regardless of what the topic is. Uh, and so that's a fantastic thing to think about in terms of how am I linking these things together? Uh, and, and actually, uh, same thing with text. Uh, when you look at the, did you ask the student to provide evidence? I can think of a whole host of simulations where you want to ask a student to provide evidence, particularly if it's a simulation about inquiry-based learning. <laughs> like, what is the evidence, right? Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities to link um, simulations together around common annotation goals. And what's powerful about that is the acceleration with which data is collected. And that acceleration of data collection will lead to an acceleration of an improved classifier, um, which then everyone is benefiting from. And that's partly why we're creating a system, creating a community of practice, and, and trying to coordinate folks uh, around common goals. Uh, so when it comes to feature engineering or pre-processing your data, uh, when you're working with text, you're, you're sort of working with the words. Uh, when you're working with the uh, prosodic features, you're working with the audio. And um, I'm not going to do that today. Uh, so we don't have enough data to really do that. So I'm going to save that for the next session. Uh, but I want to give you a quick preview. Uh, so when you're doing text analysis, uh, one thing that you can do is do, generate n-grams of your data. And the n-grams can basically take a phrase and break it into features. And so you could use one word as a feature. You could use pairs of word as a feature. And you could use triplets of words as a feature. Um, and I'll walk you through a process of doing this with your data next week after we've actually had enough data to create an n-gram text classifier um, with sufficient information to sort of train and test and see how things go. Um, when it comes to audio, um, what I'll walk through next week is the notion of using uh, parcel mouth. And uh, it's basically a Python wrap for prot, which is an industry standard vocal analysis tool. Um, and in the scripts that we have, we extract 61 prosodic features from audio files. Um, so there's really two different ways to do audio classification. One is with um, MFCCs. If you're familiar with audio, you know what I'm saying. If you're not, don't worry about it. Um, in the work that I've done, uh, parcel mouth appears to be a little bit better at building classifiers. And so that's what I'm going to start with. But um, next week, I'll actually share scripts that both do parcel mouth processing as well as a variety of other approaches. Um, we'll walk through one of them, but we'll also put links into the rest. I'm just previewing right now because I don't want to um, burden you with too much to process this week, um, but we'll, we'll save it for next week. Um, so going back, recall uh, that when we build a classifier, we're predicting Y given X. Uh, we're using that label and we're using those features. And that will drift, that will change, that will shift. Um, and so we have to think about that continuous cycle of improvement. Uh, so as we go and train this classifier, uh, we're going to, again, do this next week. But once those features are extracted, we're going to train a classifier. And then the next step is to look at the accuracy. Um, as this is geared towards sort of introductory to machine learning, I just wanted to quickly say that in terms of accuracy, what we're going to be looking at is some of the base, most common metrics. Um, so we'll be looking at um, precision and recall. And I just wanted to quickly mention that today as a preface for how we'll go through and evaluate classifiers next week. Um, but precision, um, there's different ways of being accurate when you're making predictions. Um, one way of being accurate is when I make a prediction, I'm very confident that that prediction is correct. So if I say this person sounds confident, I'm very, very precise in, in saying that someone is confident. So when I say they're confident, they're, they're actually confident. It's matching up with my label data. Um, recall is when you're trying to make sure everyone that does sound confident gets labeled as confident. So if you're focused on recall, you're trying to make sure that, that uh, your predictions of confidence are really capturing every confident expression. But when you do that, that sort of lets in some false positives. So recall frequently, it's a trade-off decision. Do I focus on precision or do I focus on recall when I evaluate my classifier? Um, and let me just give you the really simple way that I normally explain this. 
Um, if you're focusing on precision, oops, if you're focusing on precision, um, I uh, will use medical terms for this. Uh, if I was predicting that someone had cancer and I was gonna give them chemotherapy, I would wanna be precise with my prediction. I would not wanna send someone to chemotherapy uh, as a false positive. That would be a really, really dangerous thing to do. Um, and uh, in the other case, if I'm focused on recall, um, that's really appropriate to like an outbreak type situation. If I'm gonna put people in quarantine, I wanna make sure everyone that should be in quarantine is in quarantine. Even if I have some false positives, I really wanna make sure that every positive is accounted for within my predictions. So those are the two ways of thinking about what precision and recall really, really surface. And, and as you think about your work and what you're doing, uh, I would encourage you to think about precision as the goal, um, in part because the reason that we're training these classifiers is to provide some form of an intervention. And as you provide those interventions, like you saw today with Jeremy's journal and the dynamic support, you want to test if those interventions are effective. And if you have false positives where people are getting into that intervention, um, where they're maybe not the right person, then you're gonna have some noise in the evaluation of whether or not that intervention is helpful. If you're precise in your predictions, then the intervention is really going to people that you feel very confident actually need the intervention. You're only giving chemotherapy to the people that actually have cancer. And so you can really test the efficacy of the intervention and is it actually doing what it's supposed to do. That's my encouragement, but I recognize that different aims, different goals, different groups, different focuses. Um, I just want you to know that there's a couple of ways of evaluating and figuring out what's right for your evaluation is part of the process. And again, we can do that tomorrow or next session, as well as in our community of practice, continued support as you go through this process of learning how to construct AI, integrate it into the system with dynamic supports. Uh, I will say this, um, one of the things that we will be doing in the next version of the system that we're creating is capturing demographic information of our users, particularly to look at algorithmic bias. Um, you could actually do that today. You could add a slide at the beginning of your simulation that asks people to report things like gender, race, ethnicity, disability status, ELL status, um, and then use that demographic information to check not only where am I accurate, but for whom am I accurate? It could be that if you're uh, doing a classifier that's looking at prosodic expression, that maybe gender is having an influence on, on who it's accurate for. Uh, I'll tell you that we have seen that with the confusion classifier. It's actually really interesting. We have far less male voices because we use uh, teacher preparation programs where it's frequently more females uh, in, in the class than males. Um, we have a smaller sample of male voices, but our accuracy in predicting confusion for male voices is higher than it is for females. We don't yet know why, we're still ex examining that. Um, but that's the type of analysis that I wanna encourage everyone to start thinking about now, because uh, it's really hard to capture that demographic information after the fact. Um, so if you, if you think about your revision process today, um, what demographic variables might be important to include would be a great topic of discussion within your groups. And then just add a slide at the beginning that sort of asks for this demo information. Future versions of the platform is probably gonna integrate collecting of demographic information for users. Uh, so, you know, but for now, um, just add a slide and that'll be sufficient. Uh, we're not gonna go through the evaluation bias today. We're saving that for next week. And then operationalization, again, we don't have the chance to do the deployment of your classifiers because we were not able to create them, but I do have links to all of the resources that you need to learn how to deploy. There are three open source projects DCSS Remote AI Service Integration, as well as, um, which is basically the architecture that you're deploying to when you add a classifier to teacher moments. Um, and there's an example of DCSS sentiment analysis, which you can literally fork this project and put in your own text classifier and call it something different and deploy it. And then that will be ready to integrate into teacher moments, as well as the DCSS confusion analysis project, which is an audio classifier. And again, you can just fork this GitHub repository, replace the classifier that's in there with your classifier, and then deploy that. Um, and again, we'll go through some of this next week, and we'll have ongoing support for anyone that's not familiar with these processes. But the really exciting part is that we have two proposals that is going to automate all of those steps. Um, so we're planning on upping the architecture for teacher moments such that it will take data that's been labeled through the system 
using the annotation component, extract features, train classifiers, do an analysis of accuracy and bias, and deploy it into the system. So ideally in the future, as you're using teacher moments and working towards AI, you will not have to do those steps. Um, you're welcome to continue to do them. The whole architecture will continue to support independent AI processing and creation. And it's highly possible that if you are into learning a bunch about AI, you will outperform an automated platform of this nature. And in fact, one of the things that people at MIT might do is they might look at some of this data and see if they can train a better classifier and deploy it to the system and help improve other people's work and just report on what sort of innovative machine learning work that they're doing at MIT uh, and how they were able to outperform baselines from an automated system and then deploy an improved version that people in the community of practice can use as they use teacher moments and AI. Uh, so it's exciting times. We've got two bids out there. You're welcome to read them if you want um, around the motivation and the approaches that we plan on taking to achieve that automation. Um, but there's probably a very small set of people that are interested in, in, in getting into the weeds on that topic. Uh, but it's there if you're interested. Uh, so again, our goal here and what we're working on through these workshops is we're trying to empower you as an AI researcher. Um, we have aims for automation that's going to support that. And we have resources to support you to do it manually uh, until that automation is in place. Uh, and again, feedback about this whole process. And like, if there's anything in that presentation, again, it's a preview. We're going to actually go through the steps next week. But if there's anything in that presentation that got you worried or concerned, um, you'll have a chance to give uh, us feedback about that in the exit survey so that we can make sure that we address concerns, clearly articulate and spend appropriate time to make sure that you're learning everything that you need to learn to leverage the system to achieve your goals. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to generate a platform that supports you uh, to do AI research. Uh, so you're authoring a simulation, you're creating an annotation question, your users are using the simulation, they're annotating the data, and then a classifier is trained and deployed to the system. And each community can either work independently, or as I have encouraged, find ways to coordinate around common problems. Like if there were a need to predict confidence in vocal expression, multiple simulations could benefit from that. Um, so as we get back to work groups, before we get there, here's my um, top level message on selecting an AI goal. Um, really, this is a game of trying to understand what is theoretically interesting and pragmatically possible. Um, and so what I'm showing here is sort of the process that I went through in looking at a confusion classifier. And when trying to um, build a confusion classifier, I started looking at uh, Sidney DeBello's dynamic affect model on the left, which is the notion that when people are learning, they're going in and out of equilibrium. Um, and when they're in a disequilibrium, they frequently uh, experience confusion. Um, when I think about that dynamic affect model, and I go to self, uh, um, self's model of learning from simulations, which is the shift model, um, in a simulation frequently, Someone will go through a simulation, they'll question their behaviors or their beliefs. And when they question them, one thing that can happen is they can immediately disregard um, what raised that question. And if they disregard the event, they sort of missed an opportunity for learning. Um, if they question their beliefs and behaviors and that escalates, they might say, oh my gosh, I didn't do what I wanted to do. That's not how I am. That's not, that's not how I want to behave. Um, that will be an experience of falling short. Um, I have an idea of what I would like to do. I have an idea of how to be equitable. Um, but when I actually got to the situation, uh, what I produced as a response was inequitable. And I just feel like I was not able to perform uh, in a way that aligned with my beliefs. That falling short experience, again, could lead to disregarding the event. It might be like, oh, wait, no, it's just not that important, and I'll ignore it. Um, and again, missed opportunity for learning. But if that escalates, to revising your beliefs and your behaviors, that's where learning from simulations can really take place. So if I question my beliefs, I escalate to the experience of falling short, and then I revise my beliefs, this is where that learning is taking place. And so by connecting the dynamic affect model with the shift model, I outline how I believe confusion might be related to this process and why I think it's an important indicator of learning from simulations. All right, so I think confusion is awesome. But is it practical? Can I pragmatically create that classifier? Um, wait, let me just stop sharing my screen so that I can make sure that I share it with audio. And I know I might be close to time here, Sarah, but I am uh, I'm almost there. 
but this is just really fun. So uh, I would encourage there's, let me uh, copy this link address and put it in the chat. Um, when we get to a break, you might be able to, uh, you might be able to uh, look at this and see, um, Al, you asked in the chat, I apologize, I wasn't looking at the chat. So I'll make sure that I spend a little bit of time um, going into uh, classifiers, um, but this is a great resource. Um, so Cowan um, has spent a lot of time doing vocal analysis. I think of this as one of the best bleeding edge um, databases out there in terms of audio classification. And uh, what you do typically when you create an audio classifier, and this is something that I'm personally critical of um, in a good way, uh, that, uh, that you'll typically have the exact same phrase read by a bunch of people with an instruction of what emotion they should be portraying when they read that expression. So you're really trying to clinically control a modulation of the exact same phrase across different emotions so you can get at the prosodic features that are representative of that emotion. Um, that's not what we're doing with teacher moments. With teacher moments, we're doing simulated responses, which are closer to real world conversation data. And let me tell you, um, teacher moments is out on a limb and bleeding edge in trying to build classifiers around more natural responses rather than active responses. Um, and so I think that we're doing a very different approach. I respect that both are valuable, um, but let me show you, um, this is one interactive diagram of vocal expressions where actors have read the same phrase using different emotions as they express them. Uh, so a confused response sounds something like this. That's exactly what happened. Here's another confused response. That's exactly what happened. Oh, that was the same that's one. Exactly that's exactly what happened. what happened. That's exactly what happened. That, 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 that's that's exactly, exactly what happened. happened. So that's you can exactly hear that phrase. Happened. And these actors have been asked Let to me tell you something. express it in a confused voice. You can also see distress. Let me tell you something. Here's fear. That's exactly what happened. Here's sadness. Let me tell you something. Here's some boredom. Let me tell you something. Desire. Let me tell you something. Amusement. Let me tell you something. Surprise. That's exactly That's what happened. Exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Anger. Let me tell you something. All right. So you get the sense. Um, and when we look at the pragmatically possible, what I always encourage is look around the field and see what others are doing. Um, if you can see that someone else is trying to measure or build models around the thing that you're trying to measure, that's a great indication that it is possible. Uh, so the model that uh, Cowan et al. is building with emotional expression on short emotional outbursts, looking at confusion, um, this is a pragmatically possible measure. Uh, so what we're doing right now with our work is thinking about all of the labeled data. We've collected 10,000 labeled audio files, on how to uh, predict confusion, and we continue to work on improving that classifier. I will say I have reached out to this group to be a beta on the product development to think about a potential of integrating all of these predictions into teacher moments. Uh, so it's possible that if we get signed up for the beta on this product, all of these measures might actually get incorporated into the platform, which would be very nice. Um, so uh, Cowan, if you're listening, uh, put me on the beta. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, so um, one final note, to think about. Um, as you go through the process of doing retrospective labels, what you're doing is you're asking people that are in a machine learning world sense, not a trained grader. So typically, when you look at the Cowan data set and you do it very clinically, um, what you're doing is you are using raters sometimes that are just trained to look for specific features to classify how something should sound. And there's normally some sort of a code book and instructions. Um, and people are really, it's an execution task. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you were to say, try to code emotional or to positive responses in text, um, you might ask people to code anything that says, uh, happy to see you as a positive response. Um, so you get instructions like this. Now the benefit is you get really consistent data when you do it that way. And you actually celebrate high levels of consistency. You say, we reached a high level of inter-rater agreement. Lots of people that looked at this gave it the same label. Um, the cons to that is that it's a, it, it becomes just an execution task. I could actually tell people 
to label anything that mentions Star Wars as a positive comment because I love Star Wars. Uh, is it a positive comment? No. Did they get a high level of agreement? Yes, because it's very easy to tell if someone's talking about Star Wars. Um, I could have them all label that as positive. So the instructions that I give, if they are misguided instructions, um, they're really not helping you measure the thing that you want to measure. Um, but you can get high levels of agreement and you can get precision and you can clearly say, I think that Star Wars means a positive comment and that's what my model is able to predict. And I've got really high levels of agreement on it and that's great. Um, so I'm a little critical of giving people instructions um, and that's just part of my nature, I think. Uh, and the challenge, if you go with letting people just answer a question like, do you sound confident? Um, confidence means different things to different people. Um, so what you'll end up with is people using a variable criteria to identify if their response was confident. So the benefit to this is that you're really getting the variability of your participants in their evaluation of their data. They're using a variety of strategies to identify confidence. Um, but what you're not getting is consistent labels in your process. And so what that raises as a question is, what did they actually mean when they said they sounded confident? That's a question, you don't know. You have variability in your coders, you don't have training. Um, so what you wanna think about is the possibility like what I did in the confusion classifier work that I did is I asked people after annotation, uh, tell me, what did you mean when you indicated that you sounded confused? Um, I've actually taken about 450 definitions of what people look for when they sound confused and I've constructed a theoretical model of what sounding confused means. Sounding confused in this model means that there's a breakdown in one of three steps. When you're generating an idea, you have a breakdown because you have no idea, uh, or you don't understand the situation, or you don't understand the content of the conversation. If you have a breakdown in step two, you might have a lot of ideas, but you don't know which one to use. So if you have multiple ideas, you sometimes actually try to communicate multiple ideas at the same time, and people talk about this as coming out garbled or sort of like inconsistent. Um, step three, when you're communicating your ideas, sometimes this is where the physiological aspect of vocal expression kicks in. You're, you'll have a, a shaky voice. You'll have some sort of tonal change or pace change in your expression. Uh, you might have more pauses and hesitations in your communication. You might have difficulty coming up with the right word to say. Um, and all of this maps to really the two constructs of being uncertain of what to say and unclear in your communication. And folks that talked about both being uncertain and unclear typically talked about it as a causal relationship of I was uncertain and therefore I was unclear when I communicated. Um, so this is an example of, of tackling the challenge of if you let people use their intuition to model and label this data, I would encourage you to ask them to indicate what they meant by that. Um, and when you ask people what you meant by sounding confident, you could actually take those definitions, construct a model of what it means to sound confident that's grounded in your participants' beliefs about what a confident voice sounds like. And, and again, I'd be super excited to see that data collected. I'd be super excited to see um, what would come back and what that model would look like. So, oh my gosh, am I on time? Well, look at that. Yeah, we are, uh, I just changed the slide to say 2.20. So um, okay. we're gonna take a quick break and um, yeah, let's, we can, I'll pop the link to the slides in um, the chat again. So everyone can see um, Garen's amazing slides <laughs> um, and Josh and Marvez's. And so um, we'll come back around 2.20 and then um, we're gonna have time in our breakout rooms. Um, and then, and Garen, do you want to um, answer questions in the chat, maybe that are sure. there? Yeah, yeah, so, I'll, I'll sure. jump in there. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in just a couple minutes. Okay. I think just reflect on everything. I think reflect on everything that we've talked about through the course of the workshop. I think there's been some nuggets across there. You don't have to do everything. It's an iteration. So just do the next step, the next step towards the right thing. And then when we start scaling out the data collection, like. I'm going to ask my mom if she can do all these simulations, like reach far and wide, like get everyone that you know. Uh, I'll ask my wife if she can go and do these simulations, right? So we'll, we'll get a bunch of data collected this next week. And um, there's a question in the chat about the IRB. Um, Garen or Josh, do you want to talk about um, research and ethics and et cetera? <laughs> Josh, my son's just walked in the door. Could you take the IRB uh, question? Sure, yeah, yeah, happy to. 
Um, so this, all of the data we collect is collected under the MIT IRB. And so we have approval to uh, collect anonymized data to use for uh, research. If you are using this, you, your own institution might have some different rules about uh, using the data. Uh, so, for example, if you, you might have to go through and get IRB approval specifically for collecting data, um, but, you know, the, this workshop is more educational, so we're not necessarily expecting to, you know, publish findings out of this. It's more for your own edification and learning how to use the system. Um, I think, you know, if, if that's what you're using it for, then I don't think you need to go through a formal IRB process. Uh, but if you're thinking kind of long term, but oh, I might want to do a research study, um, and your institution requires it, then you can, you can go you can go through your own institution. And, and I would say in Spire CSAI, I worked with like 22 professors of education going through that IRB process, and it was very different by the institution that they were working in. Um, and so we do have some experience sort of helping people navigate those those decisions um, and making sure that they're connecting and asking all the right questions to all the right folks. Uh, so a community of practice event would be a great place to come in with questions about, hey, I want to set up an IRB with my institution. Um, and, you know, what have you done in the past? Um, how has that looked? And this is what my institution is expecting. Uh, and we can help you navigate through those decisions. Um, and Zarka, did you have another, your hand is up to another person? Uh, yes, just um, because I have, um, so the scenario I we created was on cyberbullying. So I was trying to test that on my pre-service teachers because I teach undergraduate. I'm a professor at Cal State LA. So I, I live in Cambridge, but I teach online and I wanted to test that scenarios out even without IRB. So I asked the associate dean and I was not allowed to test the scenarios. I'm not even collecting the data for for research purposes, I just wanted to have the feedback more, you know, as you know, in AI, you need more set of data to understand how the AI works. And I was not allowed. So my concern was I taught 30, 50 students last semester. I have 30, 50 pre-service teachers and they're all on equity. They are urban school districts. And so that was mm -hmm. the perfect, you know, way to test this whole thing with my set of students as a lab, because I do technology labs at tech labs. So I was planning on it, but I was not allowed. So my only concern is not research. It's mostly about uh, how do I test the scenarios out with my own students. So yeah, I was so asked to do an IRB and I don't know. So I'm like, that's a long process. Okay, yeah, so we, what I would say is that both uh, Amy, Amy Aguchi is on, on the call right now. Um, Amy has, has done the same thing with creating scenarios and using it with, with her own students in her class. Uh, that might be a great person to uh, reach out to and connect with and, and get some advice on that. Uh, but I do know that it's variable by institution. So there are some institutions that we've worked with, like in Indiana, where if you are uh, doing teacher education and you're using uh, research to improve your own teaching practices, that that is blanketly covered by like Indiana University's IRB. Like if you're doing this to improve your own teaching, uh, you are you are allowed through the IRB of the university to collect data to inform how to better serve your students. Um, so some institutions adopt a strategy like that, but not all. Um, I'd say that there were other institutions that we worked with that were much more hardlined with IRB approvals. And um, and again, it can take a lot of time to go through the IRB process. Um, but we do have a wealth of knowledge, and we've worked with a lot of people that have been through that process. So if that's something you want to pursue, um, sign up for a community of practice event. Uh, send Sarah a note and say, we want to talk about IRB today. And, and th then we can incorporate and connect you with resources and support uh, in terms of navigating that, that process. Thank you. Awesome. Um, all right, I'm going to open up our breakout rooms and folks will have a chance to pop in there and talk to one another. Um, and we uh, from TSL are going to pop into those rooms as well because um, we're hoping to be a resource for you. So I'm gonna open those up and we'll be in there for about 20 minutes and then we'll come back together to end our time. Um, so the goal is not to make these scenarios uh, perfect. The goal is just to refine them uh, one more time and then get some more data and then see what that data tells us. So um, we're hoping that you now at least have a plan um, for what you and your teammates are gonna do over the next couple of days 
um, before Monday morning when we blast this out to um, now really everyone we know. Like last time we got like, you know, all our colleagues, but this time it's gonna be pretty much every strangers on the street. We're just gonna send this to absolutely everyone we can think of. Um, and we hope that you will do the same. <laughs> so um, Garen, do you wanna put up, we've got just some next steps. Um, pretty basic next steps, um, which is, you know, they're basically do, please finish your scenarios and um, we're gonna share them. But um, next steps, oh, we forgot to talk about um, share outs, but we're, um, are there any groups that want to um, say just something briefly about a, one change that you're planning to make if there's any brave soul from a group who wants to say um, one change that you're thinking about? And I, I can share it. Maybe we'll make the TSL staff share because <laughs> um, I know you're all brave souls. Um, in our group, um, we were talking about, um, this is the student self-directed digital literacy. And the scenario was designed for um, young people to do, but um, we talked about changing it so that teachers, so that it's focused not on what the young people are thinking, but what on the teachers are teaching the young people. Um, so hoping that the data um, is a little bit stronger the next time with that change. Um, I'll share that when I was working with AC and Amy, um, they're adding a slide at the beginning to collect demographic information, and they're adding a slide at the end to get a definition of what people meant when they say they sounded confident in their response. Um, and they were really happy with the first initial data collection of 15 records, and they said that uh, they will make sure that the, when they recruit people to do things that they'll recruit people to do all of the scenarios so that everyone gets data collection. Um, so I felt like that was a really, really nice uh, conversation and I was was fun. Um, just like old times and the old Inspire CSAI project, I, I had a really good time uh, working with Amy and AC again. Yeah. Uh, Josh, uh, you want to tell? Oh, sorry. Mar oh, no, Marvez volunteered. Thanks, Marvez. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the group I was with, we discussed um, different ways that they could use um, topic modeling before they went moved um, on to building classifiers. And they also discussed how maybe they need to split one of their annotation questions into two questions and how to refine the text to make it uh, more precise for what they're looking for. Um, and in the group I was in, we talked about, you know, the aligning the decision points in the scenario with the overall goals of the scenario, thinking about what are we trying to figure out what people know and can do and make sure that the scenario is collecting that type of data. And then eventually kind of in the future, thinking about how can we incorporate good feedback, but focusing right now on the, on the, on the data collection piece. One thing at a time is our goal. <laughs> awesome. So um, yeah, we, oh, I think we had, next, were there next steps back before this one? Um, there you go. So revised scenarios um, are going out. Um, please play at least two. We'll be playing all of them. We hope you can play all of them too. And please share them with uh, everyone you know and strangers you haven't met yet. And uh, we're going to try to get, we're aiming for 100. We'd be happy with 50 and we'll take what we can get. So um, we're hoping that we will see lots. And then I will pop the exit survey into the chat. And again, um, we would love to get your feedback as we're planning for next time. What is it that we need to review? What is it that you still are curious about? Um, what should we make sure that we cover next Saturday? So there's a exit survey in the chat for you to fill out. Um, you want to go back into the breakout rooms. Yeah, we can go back into the breakout rooms um, to make a plan, especially to like make a plan to move forward. And then um, 10 more minutes, JT, can we have 10 more minutes? Oh, good. I just have something in an hour. So we're good, we're good for you. All right, thanks. So we'll go back in for like 10 more minutes. Um, but if you, so I can open those rooms again. Um, so if you wanna spend some time um, in your breakout room, that is great. If you have to run, um, we completely understand. If it's two in the morning and you have to go to bed, um, we completely understand that too. So uh, thank you so much for joining us.
spending part of your weekend with us uh, whenever it is and wherever you are. <laughs> we really appreciate it. And I, and I just want to thank everybody for coming and I want to thank all the presenters for sharing their ideas and their scripts and their resources. And uh, again, just want to plug that community of practice that Sarah runs. Um, it'd be fantastic if you were able to join. Um, we just love talking about this stuff. We talk about it all the time at work and it, we talk about it all the time to whoever shows up at the community of practice. And we're super curious about like what challenges you're running into, like IRB issues or implementation details or uh, I tried this thing with this group and it was synchronous or it was asynchronous or it was global and whatever that you're doing, uh, we'd love to hear about it and find ways to support the efforts that you're undertaking. So stay in touch. I'll say the exit survey has um, a, a spot to sign up for the community of practice. Um, and I can also just, Al, if you want me to add you, I can just add you. <laughs> Anyone feel free to just shout out, please add me. <laughs> and I'll do it right now. Awesome. Yay. Oh, we're so excited that you want to join us for more, more teacher moments. All right. Fabulous.